District 4, uh, just to uh, lay out a little uh, uh, geography for you as it relates to the, the area here that uh, you're all part of, uh, we basically have five counties stacked on the eastern seaboard above Miami-Dade, which is District 6, FDOT District 6. Uh, we have Broward, Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, Indian River County right on the eastern seaboard. We go all the way up to Brevard County beginning of District 5. So that's the area that we're, uh, we're uh, operating. Uh, I've been the Traffic Incident Management uh, Coordinator there for about nine and a half years. And um, I was asked to come on up here and speak um, about our program that we had down there, the, uh, the 595 project. And I'm going to lay out a little bit of geography, show you the layout of the highways that uh, we are dealing with uh, down there. And then I'm going to turn it over to Chief Gonzalez from the Davy Fire Department. And uh, he's going to go into the more technical information. So uh, the 595 corridor, 595 corridor um, is, the, is the angled highway here between I-95 and I-75. You can see we have the Florida Turnpike running down through our jurisdiction also. Uh, this is the area that uh, they're in control of and the relationship of the other highways that are here. Um, this is a, a closed facility, meaning there is one entrance at the beginning of the express lanes and an exit at the other end. There are no additional egg entrance or, I should say, ingress and egress ramps. Um, once you enter the facility at the far west end or the far east end, you travel all the way through the facility, which makes it a lot easier to manage and traffic <coughs> concerns are not uh, so much of a problem. Uh, morning uh, hours, we run uh, eastbound from uh, 136th Avenue. It actually starts around 136th, and then uh, motorists traveling east have the option of either uh, entering the uh, Florida Turnpike facility or traveling past 441, where the uh, current project ends. Uh, there are plans in the future for uh, another phase that is coming up, uh, phase 3C, where they're going to tie um, the lanes just west of full, or just east of 441 to I-95. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, westbound, uh, rush hour, same thing, you can enter from uh, 595 from the airport in the Port Everglades area, US-1 area, downtown Fort Lauderdale. You can enter the facility or enter it from the turnpike and exit out at uh, west of 136th Avenue. So um, this is uh, about dead center in uh, the 595 area, just showing you a little bit of nomenclature here. Um, the toll lanes are in the center uh, they are uh, just uh, one direction. Uh, we have eastbound and westbound, 595 on both sides of that. And then along the side, we have State Road 84. So we actually have five separate highways uh, that are configured in this one area. And uh, these are some early photographs just prior to the opening of the facility a couple years back, I think 2014. Um, showing uh, a westbound approach. There are uh, three lanes, three directional lanes, either morning or afternoon. And we have sufficient shoulders here for uh, emergency responders. Um, here's another photograph. And I want to point out to you in these that you'll notice uh, there are green bands here on the lights. Uh, in the center of the highway. George is going to talk about that in just a little bit. That was a really neat innovation uh, that uh, somebody came up with. I'll let him explain that to you. Here's another photograph of a section now that it's been uh, uh, populated uh, with traffic. You can see the bands in the center are yellow. And here's another photograph of, of an area where they're orange. Uh, this is down uh, closer to uh, University Drive, State Road 817 in that area. So 
Um, as uh, with the i4 Ultimate, you can go to the uh, Turnpike for 595 Express Operations if you're looking for any additional information. Previous documents are posted there if you're looking for any uh, uh, data. And then the I-75 corridor, uh, which is a, an express lane project that is currently uh, nearing completion. I'll point out again the 595 pro, pro, uh, can't get the word out of my mouth, sorry. Uh, the uh, express lanes here, I-75 travels down and then goes into Miami-Dade County, District 6, and joins the Palmetto Expressway. And this is uh, a fairly recent photograph of the express lanes on I-75. And as you can see here, we have uh, two directional uh, express lanes. There is a concrete median barrier in the center. And um, the, we have actually a grass median between the northbound I-75 lanes and the northbound express lanes and the same with the southbound side. And people have asked, there are, to my knowledge, there are gonna be no guardrails and there'll be no delineators. Uh, you would theoretically be able to, in an emergency, uh, drive over into the grass area as a motorist. And the reason, uh, the reason I wanted to show these photographs is that this is gonna be somewhat similar to the I-4 project that you're going to have up here in this area. The difference is, as I understand, is that you're going to have barrier walls between the express lanes and the, the general purpose lanes. Uh, this is a close-up uh, ground level, and as you can see, obviously, the final friction code is not down, so we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, lane markings right now. And uh, this is a little bit farther north up uh, approaching the uh, 595 area. Again, we have two lanes that are still separated here. I'm leading up to the next picture here. You'll see at the, the end of this, because 595 is a one-way directional facility, um, that they're not going to be able to run two-directional traffic um, on I-75. So there will be a point that is just south of 595 where Northbound and southbound traffic will merge. Traffic will be closed at a certain point on the I-75 uh, express project to allow the uh, uh, morning or afternoon egress that would uh, coincide with the 595 project. Um, this is a layout of uh, the additional ingress and, e uh, ingress and egress points on I-75, which obviously makes it a little bit more uh, congested um, on the highway with the ingress and egress of vehicles during peak hours. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out to you that George will talk about is the, won't show up on those TVs, the uh, pink uh, legends right here or emergency access crossovers from, for example, the northbound general use lanes to the northbound express lanes. And uh, currently, uh, Tom Dixon got me a copy of this just a couple days ago. This is a, a drawing of an area um, where emergency responder vehicles can cross over from general use lanes into the managed lanes. The wider portion of this is 55 feet and the uh, smaller portion is 45 feet and uh, as I understand there will be uh, a line of delineators that will be across this area to uh, uh, discourage uh, public use and again the I-75 project uh, information is there if you need it would like to uh, look at information so from the traffic incident management point of view, obviously, the, uh, uh, as I understand, uh, the public meetings for the I-4 Ultimate have long passed. Uh, the, the initial meetings where the diagrams were, were presented in a room and there were easels with uh, 
photographs of, of proposed ideas and, and what the roadway looks like now and what it's going to look like in the future. That's gone. Um, we took the initiative of having the Florida, High, uh, Florida Department of Transportation and the CEI come into the TIM meetings and do their own presentations regarding the, uh, the construction of the project and the effects it'll, it will have on, on traffic. Uh, the proposed overall design when it's done gave, gave people an opportunity to ask questions and uh, understand what was coming down the road. And I think even with a lot of projects, even with all that information being available, once the, the construction starts and things kind of construction takes over the roadway, you really have no idea what it is you're getting into because it really becomes an animal in and of itself. And as incident responders, you deal with changing roadway and highway conditions on a daily basis. Where the northbound lanes existed yesterday when you were working and you came back to work today, or if you're a firefighter and you came back to work two days later, the roadway configuration has changed. And I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is that fire rescue agencies, law enforcement agencies, your training units, that you have somebody that keeps in touch with the PIO for the project, that you review the weekly um, uh, status reports or construction updates, um, and make sure that your personnel understand that, because obviously operating emergency vehicles yesterday up that roadway and operating it tomorrow you may wind up with different roadway configurations or curves or lane shifts that weren't there. It really becomes important that your personnel keep up to date on a daily or a weekly basis. Um, we had a special invitation to affected agencies and in this case um, we reached out to several fire rescue agencies that are along I-75, law enforcement agencies, actually had a poor showing which is not unexpected with law enforcement and fire rescue agencies. Um, and then when they begin to perceive that there's a problem, they get very vocal. And we needed them to be vocal way back earlier. We needed them to, to take ownership of, of part of this construction project that was none of their concern. We needed them to be involved in it a lot earlier. So if you are a law enforcement or fire rescue agency now, and you are just getting involved in the project, better late than never. Um, understanding that obviously plans have been made, things are in the process of already occurring, um, asking people to change their minds is really hard to do. But as incident responder agencies, I ask you to really take a very, a very active role in the traffic incident management and the, the construction process. Um, those were the agencies that we reached out to, um, and I think that's it. Good morning, how's everybody doing today? I brought my notes up here, and uh, I, I, I never look at them. I just make all kinds of notes, and I put them there, and then I forget about it, and then I just say what I'm gonna say when these slides come up. So if I'm off sequence a little bit or, or doing any of that kind of stuff, please um, bear with me. And then if you have any questions, I think that's part of uh, the biggest um, problem that we start dealing with here is sort of what I'm going to present to you is going to be a little different project where we got started from the beginning, but we're in the middle of that I-75 project that was being mentioned that we weren't invited to the table from the beginning. Even though we tried to get there, uh, we didn't get to the table from the start. So uh, we're sort of playing a little catch up like you are also now. So um, understand there's problems. Nothing that we went through even starting from the beginning was easy. So if there's anything I can say in dealing with these issues is, you know, the collaboration has to be there from everybody. Um, Open-mindedness has to be present for new ideas and innovations that uh, Dwayne was talking about a little earlier. Uh, all the innovations we have there. So when we had this project come up and they were planning on doing this the way they did it, we, we looked at it as an opportunity to change how we provided services to the roadways on the highways that we managed. 
And I'll talk a little bit about our agency, just so you can see where we're located, the amount of highway that we have going through uh, and that we cover and having to manage all of that. Uh, and then hoping that that seed we were gonna plant with this project was gonna continue extending out in this whole process. And, and uh, hopefully uh, that's happened. So some of the pictures that you'll see that I uh, have on here, uh, Mike has also. So you don't see that very well, but Davy is immediately west of Fort Lauderdale National Airport. So we're first response on aircraft fires. We start off on the east end uh, on I-75 with industrial, and then we cover all the way west to the Everglades, which is rural, uh, farm living, everything. So we've got a little bit of everything uh, out there. Uh, we cover about 48 square miles. We contract to a second agency, which is the West End that takes us all the way out to US 27 in the Everglades. Um, I made this font a little bit too small to see from across the room. Uh, but we have quite a, uh, a diverse area. We have a huge educational uh, complex facility. The Miami Dolphin Training Camp is in Davie. Um, we run about 15,000 calls a year. We got seven stations, uh, uh, 175 personnel, seven ALS units, six ALS engines, a ladder, and a squad, which is a primary response to our motor vehicle accidents on the highways. So uh, we frequent those areas. Here's the major thoroughfares that you can see in there. We cover I-95 is the east end uh, where we start. Uh, we have I-75 all the way towards the west end. We cover a part of 595, uh, and we cover about, I wanna say, three-fifths of all of 595, and the express lanes are all in our jurisdiction. So from a certain perspective of managing that piece of 595, we were the primary response along with the county uh, sheriff's office that sort of assist us in the highways in those areas as well. Uh, and then we have Florida Turnpike cuts across, and then all the way out west we have US 27. So in our county, in that Fort Lauderdale area, we cover more highway than any other agency in the county, and we interact with quite a variety in highway areas covering, which is similar to what you have here, we probably have 18 agencies that manage pieces of the highway. So it all depends where you're at, obviously, and we have it. We don't get paid for it, but we gotta run them. Um, that's part of the problem that we have also, and then getting everybody to work together in this whole process. So we've got to manage that. We've got to work with DOT. We've got to work with Tim. We've got to work with the road rangers. So as we moved along through this whole process, we said, okay, what are we going to do? So from an agenda perspective, here's areas uh, that I'm going to touch a little bit base on, what the 595 project was. We got a fire suppression system built in to the highway. First in the country. That's what DOT said. We've never done this before. We asked and they said, sure. That road runs from Port Everglades. We get more gasoline tankers and more trucks going through that highway because it's a major uh, east-west corridor for Broward County. We'll talk about the response zones. We'll talk about access to the express lanes because these are solid barriers throughout. The only non-solid area is the exits and the entrances. That's pretty much gonna be it in this whole process. We'll talk a little bit about communication with 595 Authority, which is the name we gave them. We have direct communications with them. That was a key component in this whole process. We'll talk a little bit about the response procedures and the training we did leading up to this to make sure that all the agencies were involved. And I sit here and I look and we have road rangers here. We have Florida Highway Patrol we dealt with. We have the local law enforcement agencies. We have the county agency here. We have fire service here. We have Department of Transportation people. We have everything. And I'll tell you in these projects, everybody's involved, everybody's a piece. And these Tim meetings, Cheryl, where are you? Oh. She stepped out. I go to every Tim meeting, or I have one of my battalion chiefs go to every Tim meeting. And I know a lot of those Tim meetings aren't the most exciting thing for us to sit in, but there always seems to be a question come up. It's either a policing question or there's a fire question that they don't know the answer to or why we do things the way we do things. 
And that's the reason that we make sure somebody is always there. Because if we're not there to answer that question, somebody else comes up with an idea that makes no sense whatsoever, is unrelated. And just like in the fire service, where it's the fastest form of communication, which is telephone, telegraph, telefirefighter, that was a joke. Okay, all right, everybody's awake. Um, <laughs> thank you for the, for the drum roll. Uh, it, it, it just gets worsened. It, it just makes it so you can't fix it. And it's a small price to pay to be at those meetings and suffer and get some stuff done, but to be able to manage those instances. So here are the reversible lanes. Mike talked a lot about that. I'm not going to waste a ton of time here. Um, right now, we're progressing these reversible lanes into I-75, extending from Broward County all the way down to Miami. So this is similar to what you guys are doing here. I think you've got like a 41-mile corridor that you're going to be managing. This is probably about that much the I-75 project uh, that is in existence. The 595 project is a 13-mile span. So that's what it was from the east all the way to where it ends. You saw a little bit of that picture. You see the challenges we had where we had a roadway in the middle of two other roadways uh, that were managing this whole, uh, that we had to respond to now separately. From traffic volume, you can see there, I gotta use my glasses. After 40, a couple of things start going. Hair. Um, peak hours. This is information I got from them. Um, so you understand from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., you have in the largest areas of the highway, you're going to have five lanes that are eastbound, five lanes that are westbound. It never gets more than that. But there's three continuous lanes at all time, whether it shrinks or opens, three continuous lanes on all time eastbound and three continuous westbound with three additional in the middle. So in the morning when we talked about for rush hour going to downtown, every traffic is eastbound, getting all the people out from out west, uh, traveling east through those highways. So on the general purpose lanes, which is the terminology that we used, and those were another things that we had to develop and say, hey, how are we going to manage this terminology so we know what we're talking about? So we had general purpose lanes and we had express lanes. So the general purpose lanes, uh, about 10,000 vehicles an hour during these peak hours which is a, a pretty decent volume. Uh, and then express lanes, we got about 2,000 vehicles an hour. You know, we hesitated a little bit when we said, how are we gonna get to these calls? How are we gonna get in there? How are we gonna manage this? We got 13 miles. So if it's eastbound, I gotta get my farthest west station to get on the highway, get at the entrance, and then drive all the way down possibly 13 miles to get to the call at the other end or I gotta send a unit in the area that's gonna jump a Jersey barrier and the trucks aren't there and then we don't have protection and trying to figure out what it was that we were gonna do and manage this whole process. Again, some of these things at first, you know, weren't planned. How are we gonna manage this? But because we were in it from the beginning, we were able to get some of these things instituted uh, in the process uh, that we were managing this. So, uh, a lot of things develop. As you start going through these things, your questions will, be, will, will come up and they'll, they'll develop. Your DOT representatives will be there to make sure that the contractors stay right and you're there. In the end, you have to go, you have to get there. All I always said in the meetings, and I was um, uh, managing operations when we started this whole process uh, and, and attending these meetings, I said, you want us to go, we'll go. When it takes us 25 minutes, I'll explain why it took us 25 minutes, because you didn't bring us to the table and work with us to do stuff. When it could take us 10 minutes to get there. Your goal and our goal are a little different. We all have safety in common. DOT and Tim's goals are clear the roadways, and Florida Highway Patrol wants to clear the roadways. Fire service goals, we want to manage the scene, we want to make sure it's safe for the patient, and we want to make sure that we're safe from that perspective. We can get to the patient, we can treat them, and we can get out. I hate being on the roadways. FHP, um, all of you that work the highways on a regular basis, God bless you. I mean, really, I, I, it is amazing the job that you do. 
I stand out there, I see the highway moving uh, just because that's how it works and cars whizzing by you and I cannot get out of there fast enough. We've had our police agency involved in accidents on the highway. We've had our units involved. Luckily, none of our personnel involved, but units involved in some of these accidents. So we wanted to make sure that everything was done from that perspective. So I lost my train of thought there for a second, but we'll, we'll move on as we uh, start going. So uh, once we started, started collaborating in, in all these different areas is making sure that we all know what each other's goals are. So some of the problems that we had as well were road rangers. They'd show up on scene, they're yanking a car, I'm in the middle of doing something, what are you doing? So part of what we did is we, the fire service through Tim and Mike that's in here, is we did presentations in the Tim meetings. We said, here's what we do and here's why we do it so you understand. We had direct communication. I can pick up my phone right now and call the person that manages 595 Express and the road rangers and everything, and if I call, she's gonna answer. Catherine is gonna answer the phone. If she calls me, I'm picking up the phone because we don't call unless there's a problem. So if the problem is a road ranger, she's in charge. She's getting the phone call and she's addressing it. She's making sure those things are taken care of. We really had a problem in Broward County. Florida Highway Patrol had their top level people set up a meeting with the sheriff, with the county fire chief, with the fire chiefs from the agencies that surrounded the areas in Turnpike because of difficulties in response. I remember walking into that meeting and going, what am I doing here? I think I got an invitation by mistake because I was just a, a, a you know, so I, I, I shouldn't have been in that meeting. So I just sat back and I shut my mouth and I let it happen. But it had to do with missed calls and people not responding to certain areas. So we tried to figure out what we needed to do. So when Express came around, this is sort of how we progressed. So all of these things are expenses um, that was added to the project and they did it. We asked, what were they gonna say, no? They didn't, we were like, they said yes, this is great. Let's get this done and we worked it out. And every time it was about us wanting to work with them to say, get this done, we'll be able to help you in managing your roadways and clearing them quicker because I wanted to get off there as quick as possible, which was my goal. Help me do that so your goal is achieved of opening those lanes for travel again. So that was our, our system. So you can see over here, we're connecting. Uh, we've got the units there on the roadway, and this is obviously before anything was open. We did training on the highways. So all of this stuff was done before we got going. Our response zone, some of these uh, areas, because there is a corridor, we know when we get a call, it's never there. It's never where they say it's at. Because they're driving, they see the accident, they look up Knob Hill, five miles. Hey, I was at Knob Hill in 595, I saw a really bad accident. So I got a unit from two zones away responding to the accident that isn't there and playing roundy rounds. I know all you guys know about this. You'll see the fire trucks. If you're not in the fire street, you'll see the trucks driving around, lights and sirens, and they're going, where are they going? Oh, look, they just made a U-turn. They're just coming back the other way. So these were problems we were having. Here, the bigger problem was the person's in an accident on the express lanes. There's no exits. Where are they in this 13-mile span? We don't know. They don't know. Dispatcher is struggling to get information out of them. So one of the things in the collaboration and, and one of the uh, amazing things of being a small world in this whole process is the people I sat, the person that I sat in the room with in collaboration to get all the things we got done on this highway and played a role in it is sitting here. Joe Morphy, which is one of the project managers on one of your I-4 processes was the manager of the project for 595. 
So these things were things that we said, what are we going to do? And we came up with, hey, let's put uh, reflective tape, different colors, break the area in zones, so if the person has no clue where they're at, we can just say, look at the poles in the middle of the highway, what reflective color do you have? Orange, okay, well, I know where orange is, and then the zones were divided based on what unit, depending on the time of day, would respond first into that area. So westbound would be one unit, eastbound would be different units. So even our dispatchers had to get involved on how do you put that information in CAD to be able to respond the proper units at the proper time of day, whether it's westbound or eastbound, and the problems we had. So that was one of the things. So you saw on the tape, that was the original tape that was put in temporarily to open the roadway uh, that was about six inches thick that you couldn't even see, where they couldn't get the right size, so we put 18-inch tape around there. So it is a reflective piece of tape this big. It really looks pretty on the highway. I gotta, I gotta be honest, when you're driving through and you see the little colors on the post, it adds a little color to the highway. So uh, it was pretty nice. And we went red, yellow, green. We said, hey, first three colors of the light, we can figure that out, red, yellow, green. And then what do we go to next? Then we did orange. And then originally we said uh, blue. But then at night we couldn't see the blue. So we changed that one to white in that whole process to make sure that it was visible based on all those things. So then the response zones, the response cards, um, the dispatch areas, all were now based on zones and the gates that were in place to get us the best access. So you can see a couple of other things. The roadway is not open yet. On one of these pictures that might be open, there you see green uh, and a couple of different things. So, once we established being able to identify where they would be, we said, okay, how do we get there? How do we make this work to get there? So then these emergency access gate components were put in. So in the middle, you see the red spot, that's the gate. The first thing we did is how does our truck get into the gate from the general travel lanes into these gates still in a safe manner? So we said, gates better be big to fit a truck. So those gates opened on a call to the traffic incident center from the center electronically, they'll open the gates. The gates are a minimum of 18 feet, I think was the smallest gate, up to 36 feet wide, I think, or 24 off the top of my head, I don't remember right now. But the goal when those gates were built was, I want a suppression unit, a fire engine, to be able to be on the shoulder, out of the road, and have those gates open and not have that truck have to go out and turn back into the travel lanes. So they had to open enough that the truck could pull forward and then make the turn in without even exiting the shoulder of the highway. So the gates were big enough from that perspective. So these are the three components. So the first component uh, is gonna be the alerting system. We're gonna let people know that a gate's gonna be opening, it's authorized, used only, and then this will start alerting them with the yellow lights that flash back and forth leading up to the gate. After that goes on for a short period of time, then these warning gates start coming out from the shoulder. They start coming out blocking the shoulder on the emergency lane. So it'll start slowly with the yellow lights, then each one of these gates starts pushing up to clear the shoulder in the express lanes so no vehicle would get into that area. And then lastly, the gate would open up to allow us to get access in so now as we turned in, we have gates behind us blocking and warning signs leading up to this whole process so we could sneak into uh, the roadway. So based on direction, these are the, the three things that were incorporated into this process to allow us to get into the gate. So this was the configuration that we ended up with. So these were the zones, red, yellow, green, 
orange. This was still the original blue. I couldn't find the one that has the white on it. Um, then you can see along the edges, up here are the gates on one side and on the other side. So we made the eastbound gates even numbers, the westbound gates odd numbers, and they were all labeled one through five, whatever. So just based on odd or even, I know which direction I have to be traveling to be able to access the gate to make entry into the highway. Oops. And then right in here, each zone was divided with the alphabetic hydrant locations along the roadway and then the corresponding alphanumeric hydrants that would relate to that uh, uh, outlet. So hydrant A would be in zone red, outlet 1A or A1, A2, A3, A4 would relate to that one standpipe connection. So being able to locate that. Dispatch centers had these. Our personnel have these in the books. The traffic incident management team at their dispatch center looking at the cameras had these access to. And all our responses were based on this configuration. So the easiest part of this is, okay, we get the location, they can tell us the gate. How do we manage getting in the gate and getting the gate open in a timely fashion? So, this is where the communication came in. This was the one key piece that this wouldn't have worked if we didn't decide to say, why do I have to call the dispatcher who's going to call the center, who's gonna to try to get information as to where the call is, who's gonna call the dispatcher, who's gonna call my unit and tell them what they said, and then they're not talking, probably. They're typing all this information to be able to communicate in the system for the dispatcher. So, which created a problem. So we went to the table and we said, hey, can we get a radio in there? And they said, sure, give us a radio. We'll put it in there. I said, come on, we got to pay for it too? This is your highway. Listen, if you get us there quicker, we'll clear quicker. So do you want us 20 minutes to get there because we're running around in circles trying to find the accident that we know is never where they tell us it is? Or do we want to get communication in there? Well, I don't want our people telling you, listen, I'm not asking your people to tell me if there's injuries. I'm not asking your people to tell me if there's hazards. I'm not asking your people to tell me anything other than to look at the cameras that are right in front of them and tell me I'm going to a motor vehicle accident with four vehicles, a black, white, and red pickup truck, and they're telling me it's on State Road 7 and 595. Can you just tell me it's there? That's all I'm asking for. So what did they do? They looked at the map. They said, hey, I don't see the accident. Hold on. Let me pan. You know what? Yeah, there it is. You know what happened at that moment? is they realized we would get information sometimes before they would be able to identify an accident because the cameras don't cover everything. So that same dispatcher is responsible for the road rangers. So now they're getting the road rangers and they also have direct communication with Florida Highway Patrol Dispatch. So that traffic management center received the information faster or would have it ready for us when we called to confirm. We had a 13-page policy and step-by-step -step on what our crews did, but the most important thing that we told our suppression unit officer, which is the one responsible for making the call, unless a no suppression unit is responding, it would be the highest ranking officer or the primary unit going in there, is before you leave the station, when you get the call, you switch your radio channel to event three. So we went to dispatch, we went to the county communication system, we said, we have this radio that has like two million channels that you're telling us we have to have because you know, in an emergency, all this kind of stuff. And we use, out of the two million channels, we use 10. 
can we get one so we can communicate with these people? The dispatch center can communicate with them if they want to. And every agency in the county has access to that channel. So what our guy does, or girl, or officer, is before they leave the station, they say, engine 65, 595 authority. Hey, the guy's got the radio. There's the best base station that we pulled out underneath the shelf somewhere that the operations uh, manager for the county uh, communication said, listen, I got one. It's our property. We can put it on their console as a base station. I'll get you an antenna. And the antenna is sitting on a pole holding one of those computers. So that's how simple this whole communication process went on that center because we weren't going to spend the money to add an antenna. But again, here's an opportunity to establish a system similar to this if you possibly can. And we call that person, he looks at the cameras, he says, yeah, that's a firm, no, we don't have anything on Knob Hill, but if you go to Davie Road, you'll see uh, there's an accident, three vehicles there. The battalion chief is monitoring the radio also, says, wait a minute, Davie Road, not, no, <coughs> cancel station 65, station 38, they're gonna have faster access, now we've confirmed it. We may have something as simple as it's eastbound at such and such a location, and they say, we don't see it, but we see that same exact accident westbound. Again, totally different zone responding now. So what we discovered when we went back and we looked at our response times to accidents is we actually dropped our response time by like two minutes. So here's the piece of this in the communication. And when you start going through this, and, and listen, it happened to me. You have the naysayers, oh, this is going to work. How are we going to communicate? And who's going to know what? And I, so you're going to have all of that. And, you know, we, we, we looked at an opportunity to do this on 595. And after a year of doing it on 595, the turnpike called and said, hey, how can we do this? Because our turnpike was the biggest problems with uh, a three mile area having five jurisdictions that would cover. And it all depends on that ramp. Man, it's, it's on that ramp, I'm not going. That's not my jurisdiction. So, so whatever it was, now they're able to identify. That big meeting with all the people from turnpike and FHP, and I mean, the, the top people, we never revisited that. We have no problems responding any longer. We locate it. Once it's located, we know where it's at. We can confirm, say, transfer the call to the other agency and let them know where it's at. And now it's a confirmed address that we're forwarding uh, from that aspect. And then I-75, with the express lanes moving forward, and again, we have the general purpose lanes, now we're working on adding it to I-75. And it's funny, I was talking about coming up here, and I-95, is now talking about doing it also because the cameras for I-95 are right there. This is just a small area in a huge room this big that monitors all of that. But the vendors on 595 that said, we'll do this radio communication, they can still look at all the cameras there and all the video that's on there. So that is the next step. We're gonna go from a county that couldn't find an accident, and, and you had every, I mean, it was short of having the president come and say, how come you guys can't make it to a motor vehicle accident on this highway, nobody wants to go, to probably becoming the, 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 the example of communication with the people that are looking at the camera directly with the person on that truck driving saying, where am I going, oh no, Boop. I gotta turn back the other way. So something that simple. So, Moving, moving into those things. But I'll tell you, training everybody, we need to know what road rangers do. And that was great. They were here. They told us what they do. Hey, man, that was a great MOT. I love them when they show up. I know in the fire service, I love slowing down traffic and blocking everything. <laughs> if traffic is going by slow for me, I'm happy. Now I know the officer is not happy with me if I'm blocking lanes I shouldn't be blocking. And once I understand that, then we work together. And the road ranger is showing up 
and listen, I don't want to, my guys don't want to pull four cones out off the back of their truck and start blocking stuff. I got the road ranger showing up saying, I got a hundred cones, where do you want them? I'll put them for you too. But we have to coordinate with them and say, listen, when you get to the accident, you start doing your MOT, don't move anything I've established. If you want to make it bigger, make it bigger. But don't change anything, just add to what I have and make me even safer. Now, our relationship with our road rangers is great now because they show up on scene. It's a motor vehicle accident. The fire department there, there's injuries. They're coming to the incident commander and saying, hey, who's in charge? Chief, what do you need? What do you want me to do? What do you, you need me to pull that car? Is that car? Stand back. Give me good MOT. See me in about 15 minutes once we get this guy off the road, and we're good. But with lack of direction, they're just going in the direction that they usually go on, on the majority of the calls they're on, which are accidents without injuries that we don't show up. So their relationship with FHP is much better. And in addition to that, we have them respond with FHP sometimes, or they will stop and they will block for FHP if they're on the side of road on an accident, even on the shoulder, and add a little bit more protection. So the safety factor is there. If there's anybody, anybody in here, the day I took this job 29 years ago, I said, man, or, or the first day I was an officer, I said, I never want to have to write a report about me failing to provide a safe environment for my people. You can't give me enough safety. I'll take it. So this and working with all of these individuals and learning what the police officer does, the police understanding what fire does, fire understanding road rangers, road rangers understanding everything, is, it just works way better. So let me scoot through a couple of these things. So the communication procedures, we already talked about. Um, we actually, I met with Catherine who oversees the 595 Express, and here now three years after we started the project, we met the other day again and we said, let's go over this policy. Are we doing everything we need to that's right? Is there something we need to change? Do we need to add some more stuff? And what we're adding now to the policy is after our people communicate and get a confirmation or get no information from the traffic management system, now they have to stay on the frequency until they go arrival. Because the traffic management center was saying, hey, two minutes after I couldn't find it, that your guys said, okay, and got off the channel, I found it and I had no way of getting back to them. So our crew was still going around. So now, if they're not sure, they continue to where they got the accident, but they can get an update. And the great thing about it, too, is you get to an accident with multiple vehicles and there's a car all the way down there and then another one over there. And then there's three cars here with major injuries and you show up and you're taking care of these people. We have no clue what's happening over there. But we call the traffic management center and say, hey, can you get one of your rangers? It's on the way over here and have them check those vehicles to see if they're part of this accident. Is anything else happening over there? And then we already know and we can direct units of something if they need us to or not from that perspective. So procedures uh, for, for opening and closing the gate. So what we do is it takes them about four minutes to open these gates. Because remember, it's the flashers, then it's the gates, and then this thing starts opening slowly. So our people give them a four minute, hey, we're four minutes out. They're sending a road ranger to that gate because if you open the gate at the wrong place and traffic is backed up, what are people going to do? They're going to want to get out. That would be the one thing I told you. Those plastic barriers separating lanes, man, that's like not having anything on there. Just say whatever. People will cross them. People will travel. Accidents will cause secondary accidents. On these travel lanes in three years, God, I, I'm going to say maybe four serious, critical trauma alert patients that we've transported on the express lanes. Everything is one direction. They're isolated. Anything that happens in these other 10,000 cars over there is not going to affect anything in here. So those cars are going, and nothing in here is going to affect that out there. As long as I can get in, it works for me. <coughs> 
And we're not running a lot of incidents on those highways because they're isolated. People aren't looking to get off. There's none of this crisscross. They're in their lane and they're going 13 miles that way. And maybe six miles in between, they get off for an access road to the turnpike and that's it. And there's no other entrance other than the two main ones and then one other auxiliary one and one, and one side going eastbound. <coughs> so what we ended up doing is we defined procedures for this whole process. We set up our guidelines. Uh, we agreed with your uh, response zones, defined the corridors, listed all the emergency response scenarios, discussed the scenarios, and then we got everybody involved from the dispatchers to the towing people, to the risk group, to the local law enforcement, to Florida Highway Patrol, the fire department, and any agencies that would provide mutual aid force in the area because they have access to this. And then we went over scenarios. We showed up. We scheduled it on a Saturday. Roadway is closed. Let's do it on a Saturday or a Sunday. I forgot which one of the two days we said. Everybody meet at such and such a location, and we're going to go like we got a call to this location. And what are the different scenarios? We went to a one lane blocked. How are we going to manage that? We went to two lanes blocked. We went to all the lanes are blocked. Hey, an exit ramp is blocked. We went all the way to tank rollover with fuel hazard spills, hazmat teams, a simple vehicle fire, fire to use the exact, an accident with fatalities. So we made sure that everybody from dispatch to the most specialized group knew about these doors, how to access them, where to go, and the radio channel to communicate because everybody in the county has it. So if they're coming to mutual aid, they go to that channel, they can communicate, and we have that person telling us, you need to get on on Davy Road, because they know where the stations are, and they'll tell us, hey, where are you coming from also? Hey, get on on Davy Road, head westbound, and once you pass the overpass at such and such location, you're gonna be using uh, uh, emergency access gate three, and all lanes are blocked, road rangers have it, you can come back to the call against traffic. Or you can sneak in and then follow the roadway because that was the other thing. We've got accidents that block everything and then people start trying to get on the shoulders to get around the accident and everything and then that creates a backup and then we can't get to where we're at. But we went over all of these scenarios and then other scenarios that really didn't matter to us. Hey, fog, smog, heavy rain, flooding. Okay, how do, how, how do the policing agencies, how do the towing companies, how does everybody else manage these things to, to make that work? And then we said, let's get some data. So at the center, there's a call log. Every time we call, they log it down. Called at such and such a time, arrived. So these are incidents on our arrival and our ETAs, and we monitored those and how many times we don't call or how many times we call and there's no accident or they confirm or not confirm or did we tell them where the call was first or did they already have it when we called so everybody is benefiting from from this uh, from this whole process but the bottom line on this whole thing is you gotta interact the fire chief I had when all of this was going on he said we're not missing a meeting in this county so if it has anything to do with fire we're going I know we're wasting a lot of time but here do work while you're there. Check your emails, do your stuff there. You're going to this meeting, this meeting, this meeting, this meeting, you're going to these meetings, and if you can't make it, find out who else can make it. Or see who else is going. But it was because of that we ended up getting the opportunity to be able to develop this system, which now slowly is expanding countywide. So in major incidents and traumas, the trauma alerts, we know it's a 10, it's a t 10 minute ticker, you know? We want to get out of there within 10 minutes. And severe traumas, that's what's going to save somebody's life. If I can get there in five minutes less, we just bought time. And in the end, what's it about? It's about safety and saving people's lives. So if we can manage that, because that's the business we're all in, then we're doing it. But we, yeah, whoever's doing it, Put whoever's got an open mind, who's innovative, who can come up with ideas, and then when you're really pissed off because you're not budging, walk away and then come back again to where you left off because 
a lot of times we showed up and it was like, oh, we can't do that. Why? No, we can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? All right. See you later. We're not, we're not negotiating here. We're not talking about the issues. I'm telling you, here's the problem I have. It's your highway. I need you to help me fix the problem. How are we going to manage that? Everybody's got a piece of this. So, you know, like, like I would say, you know, it's a, it's a big dookie burger. Everybody's got to take one little piece of that dookie here, and, and it's not that bad. But in the end, okay, dessert is coming, and it's for real. And this is the dessert that we ended up getting.